Welcome to the Palestine Church audio podcast. We hope you enjoy this message from Dr. Ricky Paris. For more great content and updates from Palestine Church, please visit us at palestinechurch.com. Well, it's uh, awesome to be back home, and uh, I would like to stay here all the time, but when I stay in one place more than three or four days, people decide they don't like me as much as they do when I just come in briefly. And <laughs> no, but, but I, I really, uh, listen, I just got back from uh, Mexico and then I was in Nebraska and uh, I'll be leaving this afternoon. In fact, I'm going to cut out early and um, I'm so because I've got to catch a plane uh, this afternoon in Houston because I'm going to Europe. But one of the things that's happening, I'm telling you, is that God is moving all over this nation. He really is. And uh, I, you need to know also that if you get to be in this church, you are extremely blessed. Because I travel to a lot of churches and meet a lot of great churches and a lot of great pastors, but there are none that have pastors like the pastors that we have here in this church. These guys are excellent. Yeah, give a hand to the Lord for them. They're excellent, and they, they do things well, and with a spirit of excellence and a passion for the presence of the Lord. And uh, so I just want to encourage you to, to value what you have here. You have, listen, what just happened here a few moments ago, uh, whether you understand it or not, that was just the presence of the Lord just easing into this place. And he will do that whenever he finds people that are willing to let him draw near and just wait upon him. And that doesn't happen in a whole lot of places. It really doesn't. And uh, so you are more blessed than you know. And, uh, so I am, I am excited to be here with you. I want to encourage you. How many of you are on Facebook? I'm not encouraging social media, but how many of you have Facebook? Raise your hands. Okay. Then you need to be a friend of Ministries of Vision International. That's a Ministries of Vision International page. You need to be a friend. You need to be a follower of there. And I just posted this morning because that has to do with what's going on in all of Ministries of Vision International, which Palestine Church is a part. And we are over 450 churches and ministries scattered around the world. And uh, this morning, I put on that Facebook page a sermon by United States Representative, United States Congressman Trey Gowdy. When he was preaching a few weeks ago in Houston at Second Baptist Church in Houston. And some of you, any of you familiar with his name, Trey Gowdy? He's one of the fiery conservatives on, always on the news. I think he's head of the chairman of the uh, judicial, judiciary committee in the um, House of Representatives, chairman of some committees. He's a phenomenal man of God. Uh, he, he is a very fiery in your face kind of man as well. And, um, this sermon that, that I posted, uh, if you just will get beyond, uh, you might be Democrat, you might be Republican, you might be libertarian, you might be independent. I don't know what you are. Get beyond any political ideology that you have and listen to what he says, because it's a kingdom message. It is a word, a kingdom word for now. And so the next time I'm here, I'm going to ask how many of you got on and listened to that. And if you didn't, you are going to get rebuked, okay? Because I think, <laughs> I think this is extremely, an extremely important word, a timely, a timely word. Because he, and he, he's talking in there about Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. They are both from South Carolina. Senator Tim Scott is, is the first black senator I think, from South Carolina, at least since the the days of Reconstruction. And he and Trey Gowdy are both men of God, and they're very close friends. And so you just, you need to listen to this message, okay? If you have your Bibles, or you have your iPhone, or whatever, turn to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. I'll be reading verses 1, 2, and 3. Isaiah chapter 60. Verse 1, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. 
For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Throughout the book of Isaiah, the judgment and destruction that would come upon the southern kingdom of Judah and the city of Jerusalem because of sin, that judgment and destruction was being prophesied all through the book of Isaiah. But at the same time, and I love this, this is one of the most amazing things about God, he will speak the truth about judgment and about what's the consequences of sin, but at the same time, the grace of God shines through because Isaiah is also filled with promises of how God in his grace and mercy would save a remnant and would restore Jerusalem and Israel. And, and that's what this whole chapter 60, we're just looking at the first three verses, but that's what chapter 60, it's all about. It's about how God is promising that in time and in history, he would restore the nation of Israel. And he was saying a new day, a new season is coming. And, and I want to focus now on what this message, that's, there, there's a historical meaning to this chapter, and that's the historical side. But I want to focus on what these verses have to say to us, the message that, that these verses have for us, and, the, and our kingdom assignment. Okay, because every one of us, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a kingdom assignment. And the message that we just finished a, a conference a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago in, in Querétaro, Mexico, our annual conference there. Some of you were there. The, the, the message that resounded throughout that conference was that we are entering into a new season. And it's a season of grace and restoration. It's a season, uh, a day of growth and advancement. It's a, it's a day in which we will see promises and prophecies from years past that we've wondered, will they ever be fulfilled? They're about to be fulfilled. In fact, just this week, I was talking with uh, the team down there, and there is a, something that they've been waiting on for 20-some-odd years, 28 years. It's really right close at hand to coming, to coming forth. And so, so I want us to, to take a look at these verses, and what these verses say help us, will help us to step into that new season, okay? Because you can be in a new season and you can totally miss it. It can be going on all around you and, it, and, and you're left out. And, and, and so I want us to, 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 to focus on these verses, what they have to say to us for our kingdom assignment so that we don't miss out on what God's doing in this new season. And the first thing that we see in, these, in this passage, these three verses, is we see a problem. Verse 2, it says, The darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. Listen, you don't have to be too discerning to recognize that darkness, in fact, deep darkness, is covering this nation, and not just only this nation, but nations all around the world. And I'm talking about, when I'm talking about darkness, I'm talking about the darkness of sin and immorality and lawlessness and sexual perversion, racism, hopelessness, despair, addictions. My goodness, this country is racked with, with opioid addictions. And, 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 and that's dark. That's part of the darkness. The darkness of violence and sorrow. This darkness abounds in this nation and in other nations around us. And all around us, people are held in bondage by this darkness. In Central and South America, in Africa, in the Middle East, people are fleeing the, the, the deplorable and dangerous conditions in which they're living. They're fleeing because it's, 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 it's a hopeless situation. They are failed states. And so they're fleeing to the United States. They're fleeing f- from a- a- Africa and Asia into Europe. And there's a big radical shift that's taking place through migration. And people say, well, we need to stop that. Well, I've got news for you. This is nothing new. It's happened in the past. You know why this nation was settled? It was because people in Europe were fleeing from hopeless situations, fleeing from, from, from persecution, fleeing from, 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 from bondage. And that's how our ancestors, many of our ancestors, came to these shores. And it was nice because in those days, the Native Americans, their their immigration system and, and, and was not quite as, as developed as ours, and so they were able to get in pretty easily. 
taking land from them that did not belong to them. I'm sorry, I don't mean to mess with you. But the world has no solution for these problems that we're facing. Education, more money, better health care, better social programs won't fix this nation. And, and what's more, you cannot legislate the darkness away. You can get all the, the, you can get your most conservative or your most left wing or your most right wing. You can't legislate, you can't do enough to deal with the darkness that's in this nation. And people are desperate and they're looking for a solution that the governments of the world do not have. And so that's the problem is we're surrounded by darkness. But then the second thing that we can see in this passage is that there is a proclamation. Three times in these verses, the phrase, your light is employed, your light. And the first time it's used in verse one, flash verse one up there. The first time it's used in verse one, it's, it means the light, which is yours because it shines on you. Okay. Arise, shine for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And so it's talking about the, the light that is upon us. It's come to us from outside. But the second time that is used in verse three, it means the light, which is yours because it shines from you. It shines through you and out of you. And, and, and so that phrase is very key. And then the, there's another word that's very key. It's repeated three times in this, these verses, and it's the word rising. And the word rising in the Hebrew is a technical word, which really expresses the, the sunrise, the rising of the sun in the, in the morning. And it's applied his, there in that passage to the, to the flashing of glory that rises upon or falls upon Zion or Jerusalem, and then also to the light that gleams from Jerusalem, shining out to the rest of the world. So what he's saying here is this, God's glory, he says, arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. What he's saying here is this, and that is that that we already have God's glory. You've got the glory of God. God's glory is upon you. When you receive Jesus as your Savior, if you've been born again and received Jesus as your Savior, then he, by his Holy Spirit, came to live in you. And Jesus is the glory of God. And so the one who is the glory, Jesus Christ, if you're a believer, he's in us, he's in you. And so the clear proclamation of these verses is that God's glory has already risen upon you. You've got it. You may not know it, but you've got it. You may not understand it, but you've got it. If you are a believer, you've got it. Tell the person next to you, you've got the glory of God. But you'll notice in verse 1 that we're given an exhortation there, really an imperative. He says, arise and shine. The glory is upon us. So now we must rise and be proactive and intentional in making sure that the light of the glory of God is radiating from us and through us in every situation making sure that the one who is the glory of God is seen in you so everybody can see him. So they don't look at you and say, oh, wow, he's nasty. He got a bad attitude. He's arrogant, whatever. Just They look at you and they see the one who is the glory of God in every situation, in every occasion. God is to be seen radiating and shining out of us. And just as the rising of the sun dispels the darkness of the evening, of the night, so then the light of God's glory rising from us and radiating out of us will dispel the darkness that's all around us in our world. And it's very interesting. Have you ever, how many of you have ever gotten up early to watch a sunrise? Some of you probably watch it every morning on your way to work or something. Some of you, it's a rare occasion that you see the sunrise. <laughs> but, but you see, when the sun rises, 
The darkness doesn't go away all at once. The sun rises and the darkness then begins to fade away very slowly, bit by bit, moment by moment. It's the same way with us. Whenever God's glory is rising, his, the, the light of his glory is rising from us, then day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, that, glo- that, that light of the glory of God begins to push back the darkness, penetrate the darkness. It's not just an instantaneous thing. That's why we are called to persevere. That's why we're called to show up. Just show up in the Christian life. Show up at your work with Jesus. Show up in your school with Jesus. Show up with those people around you that, 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 that don't like you and you don't really care a lot for them. Show up with, with the light of the glory of God. And be intentional in letting it radiate from us. Well, let's think for just a few minutes. What is the glory of God? Let's go over to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33, where we see Moses ask God about his glory. In verse 18, Moses said, Lord, please show me your glory. I want to see your glory. Now, that was an interesting thing for Moses to ask to see the glory of God because he had really already seen the glory of God. Because in Exodus chapter 13, Moses had seen, he, was see, he saw the Shekinah glory of God whenever the pillar of fire led them in the wilderness by night and the cloud of glory led them by the day. Moses had already seen the Shekinah glory of God. And then in the wilderness, there when, in Exodus chapter 24, when they were gathered near Mount Sinai, the Bible says that the glory cloud of God came down and rested on Mount Sinai for several days. And Moses, there with the people, saw that glory. And Moses ascended and got close to that cloud, even with the elders, and they saw the glory. And, and then there came a moment when the Lord said to Moses, enter into the cloud, come on up all the way. And Moses entered into that cloud of the Shekinah, glory of God, that bright, that bright flaming fire of the glory and the light of God. Moses entered into that. So Moses had seen the Shekinah glory of God. Why is he asking to see his glory now here in chapter 33? It's because Moses knew that there was another level of the glory of God that he had not seen. And so he asked him, Lord, he said, I think there's another level of your glory I've not seen. And I want to see it. I want to experience it. I want to know it. It's a higher level than the Shekinah glory of God. And he said, I want to see it. And I love how the Lord responded to Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 9. Then he said, I will. I'll do it. The very next verse, I'll do it. I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God was saying to him, yes, Moses, there is another level of my glory that you haven't seen and I'm going to show it to you. And then he instantly ties that next level, that higher level of glory to his goodness and his graciousness and his loving kindness. And then in Exodus chapter 34, the Lord gave Moses instructions. And so in Exodus 34, he hid Moses in the cleft of the rock. And he said, I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. And I will cause my glory to pass by you, to reveal to you this higher level of glory. And so in verse 5, Exodus 34, verse 5, now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And when you hear the phrase, the word name, it's talking about his character. So I will pro- he proclaimed his name. He proclaimed his character, who he is, his person to Moses. And the Lord passed by him, passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth and keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation." Here the Lord is revealing another level of glory to Moses, a higher level, a level he has not seen, and it's not entered into his heart. It's it's not captured him yet. 
And it's the glory of his name, the glory of his character, his heart. And you'll notice that it's all love, mercy, grace, patience, goodness, kindness, and forgiveness. Well, wait, 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 wait. There's a verse, there, that last part of the verse, uh, that passage says he, he, he doesn't clear the guilty if it's the iniquity of the fathers to the third and fourth generation on the children to the third and fourth generations. Yeah, but at any point in that generational process, if one of those who is living under the generational curse of sin, if they're willing to turn to God and say, help me, I need you, forgive me and cleanse me, then he is quick to forgive iniquity and break the curse of generational sins. You don't have to live under the sins of your forefathers. Jesus died on the cross and he broke those chains so we can live in freedom. And so you'll notice all of those words there can be summed up in two words. The first one is the word grace. His love, his mercy, his graciousness, his loving kindness, forgiveness, and all of that. It's all grace. God doing for us what we do not deserve. And then there's another word there in verse 6, the last word in verse 6, and that is truth. So if you want to know what the glory of God is, it's this. It's his grace and truth. That's why in John chapter 1, John spoke about Jesus and said, the word who was with God in the beginning, the word was God, and this word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Grace and truth. You want to know what the glory of the highest level of the glory of God is that was seen in Jesus Christ and that was proclaimed to Moses right here? It's the glory of his grace and his truth. That's higher than his Shekinah glory because this is his heart. This is who he is. So when we stand in the glory that's been given to us, that means you've got all of this stuff in you. If you've been born again, you've got grace, love, mercy, kindness. That's your nature is to give out kindness, to give out goodness, to give out forgiveness. To those who don't deserve it, that's your new nature. You may not be doing it, but that's your nature. That's your identity. It's our nature to give when God's grace is, that has shown upon us and, is, and the glory of his grace that has risen upon us, then now we are to let that grace, that goodness of God's glory, the glory of his goodness, the glory of his mercy, the glory of his kindness shine through us radiate through us to people everywhere we go. Yes, we speak the truth about sin because that's part of the glory of God. Speaking the truth about sin, calling sin, sin, because that is not grace whenever you tell people who are living in in, in homosexuality or living in fornication or they're living under drug addiction. It's not grace to say, it's okay, God understands he loves you anyway, just keep on doing it. That's not grace. That's, that's, that's a lie. That's false grace. And false grace is predicated on deception. But the grace that saves is founded upon truth. And so, yes, we speak the truth about sin. But we do it in such a way that grace and mercy and kindness will f- radiate to the people that we're speaking to and they'll be overwhelmed by the goodness and the love of God. Our actions and our attitudes should radiate that grace, the glory of God's love and mercy and grace and kindness and goodness and forgiveness that's already come upon us, and that our actions and attitudes should radiate that glory of love, grace, goodness, mercy, kindness, and forgiveness to everybody. When people break the law, when people are living in sin and immorality around us, when they're living in perversion, when they're, when they're living in pornography, they're, same, they're engaged in a same-sex marriage, or, or, or if they just offend us in some way, they got a nasty character and they offend you, then, then we are to extend as much as possible, as much as in, as in us is, we are to extend the glory of God's 
love and mercy and forgiveness to those people. And then we're to use as much influence as we have to encourage others to do the same thing. Maybe even to encourage our government to do the same thing. So that amazingly, God's grace and kindness and goodness and mercy could perhaps even flow through a little bit of the United States government. Did any of you watch John McCain's funeral or part of it or listen to some of the stuff that went on? That was a man who never got up and preached a whole lot about, never said much about his faith. But he was born again, a passionate follower of Jesus Christ, and released love everywhere he went. Listen, we're to, we're to speak and advocate for truth. Never watering down what the Word of God says. But at the same time, we're to extend the love of God that is patient and kind and merciful and forgiving. We're to extend it to homosexuals, to same-sex couples, to prostitutes, to drug addicts, those who are hooked on illegal drugs and those who are hooked on opioids. We're to extend it to girls that keep having babies out of wedlock. We're to extend it to immigrants who've broken the law and have come here. Don't shout me down. We're to intentionally radiate the glory and the love of the love and the grace of God towards sinners so intentionally that we perhaps might begin to be known as Jesus was known as being the friend of sinners. Wouldn't that be a good thing to have people say about you, man, there's this guy, he's a friend of sinners. I think that'd be one of the best things that could be said about Palestine Church. That church is a church that's a friend of sinners. The worst of the worst in Palestine, Texas, can come into that place, and they're going to love them. They're going to tell them the truth about their sin, but they're going to love them anyway. Love them all the way through it. Listen, you need to get to know somebody who does not think like you, does not agree with you, doesn't even live like you. Get to know, I, I tell you, every one of you in here know a homosexual. Whether you know it or not, I promise you, you know homosexuals. Get to know one intentionally. Get to know a same-sex couple intentionally and invite them over to your house for dinner. Do it. Do it. Get to know an addict. Get to know somebody's baby mama and invite her over to your house for dinner. You and your husband and wife, you love on her. Get to know an illegal alien. And you already know them, whether you know what you do or not as well. Get to know a Muslim. There's not a whole lot in Palestine, so you may have to go out of your way. But get to know them and love on them. Invite them to your home. Go into their home. Break out of your evangelical bubble. Step into that darkness that's the problem. Step into that darkness and build a relationship with somebody who's not like you and with whom you don't agree and lavish the glory of God's grace upon them. You've got the glory. Now the proclamation is you've got it. Now let it radiate from you. And the third thing that we can see in this passage is a promise. Ooh, I got to go. We see the promise. It says in verse three, the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the rising, uh, to the brightness of your rising. The promise is, That when we intentionally, on purpose, let the glory of God's grace and truth radiate from us to those who are in the darkness around us, then those who are in the darkness will come to that light. That's what it says right there in verse 3. That's a promise of God. And so instead of throwing stones at the darkness, 
we light up the darkness and those who have been held captive by the darkness then will come to that light and to the brightness of that sun rising, the glory of God that's as a sunrise radiating from us, they'll be drawn to the light of the glory of God. Let me ask you, what is it that changes, what that brings repentance to a person's life? Is it law that brings repentance? Or is it kindness that brings repentance? It's the kindness of the Lord, which involves his grace and his mercy. So it's his glory, the glory of his kindness that brings people to repentance. It's not the law. It's not telling them you're wrong. They already probably know they're wrong. And if they don't know, then then they will find out when the light of the glory of God begins to shine through you into their heart. It's his kindness that brings repentance. I have a friend. And I was thinking about him because I met some uh, friends, mutual friends that now are going to this guy's church. I saw them yesterday afternoon. And this friend goes out of his way to, to get to know Muslims, especially Muslim imams. He's a pastor, a spirit-filled Baptist pastor. And he goes out of his way to get to know Muslim imams, but also Jewish rabbis. And I've been in meetings with him where he would bring Jewish rabbis and and Muslim imams together. And they would discuss their differences. And this guy will never relax the truth. I mean, he is truth. He will speak the truth. He doesn't water anything down. He doesn't say, well, we all believe in the same God. It's the God of Abraham. No, he does not say that. He says, yeah, we all believe in the same God, the, the, the God of Abraham. But there, we don't believe the same way because I believe that the only way to get to that God is through Jesus Christ alone. And so he's very confrontational with the truth, but in such a way that Muslims and Jews are drawn to him. And they want to know, tell me more about this. Because all they see is they hear the truth, but they see the glory of God's grace and his mercy and his kindness and his goodness and his forgiveness.